If you consider me to be a terrorist, then why allow me to walk on the streets? I mean, we all know the definition of a terrorist. A terrorist should be locked behind bars. My name is Akumri Sonny Ofehe. I am uh, an environmental and human rights activist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the uh, founder and executive director of uh, Hope for Niger Delta Campaign, an international NGO that focuses uh, its work on raising awareness on the situation in the Niger Delta. The turnaround in my life came in 1991 uh, during the June 12 presidential elections. Uh, the preparation, the election itself, and the eventual declaration of Chief Moshud uh, Abiola as the winner in an election that uh, the international, not just Nigeria, but the international con community uh, declared that election the freest and fairest election Nigeria has ever had. I think, you know, for the military to now turn around and annul that election uh, was actually like uh, a disappointment uh, for me personally. When the uh, elections were annulled and uh, Abiola fled the country and then uh, the student union movement started, you know, I was a part of the student union demonstration in the university then, you know, at, at that time. And then what further motivated me was when the same administration uh, 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 arrested Ken Sarawiwa and the eight other Ogoni people uh, for their agitation for the environmental rights of the Ogoni people and eventually hang them on the 10th of November 1995. You know, it was at that point that I knew that the the satanic uh, and uh, the satanic government of Sani Abasha at the time uh, was must not be taken uh, lightly at all that they were serious with their threats to to crush any opposition that may want to rise up against them and I think on that verge a few days after that execution I I left Nigeria and I came to Amsterdam. We thought gas flare was a blessing to our community because we didn't have light and so gas flare became a source of light at night. So every day we were even praying and thanking God uh, for providing this flare. And so unknowing to us, we were actually uh, slowly killing ourselves with the inhalation of uh, uh, the carbon content that the gas flare was bringing. And also we were drinking acid rain, you know, we, because we relied on the rain uh, for water. And so when it's windy and the wind blows the carbon content with the water mixed together that's what we drink and even our mothers then used to you know go very close to the gas flare sites and use the heat coming out of the gas flare to dry fishes to dry yam to dry melon to dry things that they will use to cook for us that we will eat so this was the kind of environment we grew up when these crude oil come to the surface of our swamps you know, they tend to suffocate the fishes. So we were even very happy that those things were helping us to, to, to weaken the fishes in a way that you can just go into the water and take the fishes because they, they can no longer swim, you know? And then these chemicals were mixing along with them. And some people fell sick. You know, some of our mothers lost babies prematurely. You know, some had eye problems, some had bronchitis, some had... Uh, 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 long related diseases and that was the situation we found ourselves until Ken Sarowewa came and then when he started talking about you know the environment of the Ogoni people how the environment has been destroyed how we need to stand up together in a non-violent manner that was when uh, you know it started occurring to us that hey wait a minute what we thought was a blessing you know, could be a cause we should listen to this man. But unfortunately, by the time his message started resonating with all other uh, areas of the Niger Delta, the military, with the connivance of the oil company, arrested this man, locked him up, 
and then eventually killed him. I see myself advocating for the terrible situation of the people of the Niger Delta in which I have also lived as a victim, you know, lived as, as an unknowing victim, lived like I thought that was the only life that was available. But thank God I happened to see the other side of the world. Few kilometers away from here we have a refinery and I've been to that refinery three times and I saw the neatness, cleanliness and the highest environmental and safety standard that is used to carry out their operations in those refineries. And that refinery is still owned by Shell. So I wonder why when it comes to the case of Nigeria, in fact the Niger Delta, they operate double standard. You are a multinational oil company and we expect that what you think is good for the American society, the Netherlands society, should also be good in Nigeria. Ignorance have paved way for awareness. I have always believed in nonviolence, and I've always believed in the principles of uh, raising your green leaves and that was what we used when we were in school. And that was what even Ken Saruwa preached, that you must dance the guns away. You must dance the violence away, you know. I have never carried a gun in my life. I have never uh, had at the back of my mind that the only way I think people can listen to my view is to uh, to the part of violence. So what actually happened is that um, I realized that, you know, I need to start in my little way to start to convince the people, to tell them the true situation of what is happening in the Niger Delta. And in the course of doing that, somehow, started resonating well with people that I actually wanted to connect with. So, in, 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 in because you cannot, you cannot do this struggle alone. I started making contact with uh, people in the, in, in, in the politics in the Netherlands. Uh, so that also brought me to The Hague and also brought me to the European Union Parliament in, in Brussels. And somehow uh, I was, uh, yeah, they started picking interest in the Niger Delta topic. Uh, there was a need for a parliamentary hearing in which Shell was uh, summoned to explain uh, their roles and activities in the Niger Delta. Then they tried to change the subject, you know, do you remember? They tried to change it into Okay, it shouldn't be titled Shell in Africa. We want to have it. Uh, uh, it, it should be titled uh, MVO, so Corporate Social Responsibility in West, Responsibility in West Africa. Okay, now that we've called it Social Corporate Social Responsibility in West Africa, let's also invite Unilever and other companies because we want to get away the attention from Shell. Yeah, so some of these parliamentarians felt, well, we cannot continue to have a company that is bearing our international name you know, continue to uh, act in, uh, in that region with impunity. And, uh, and so there's need for them to summon them and ask them to explain their role in all of the accusations. 11 days to be precise, after that parliamentary hearing, um, about 25 to 30 police officers uh, raided my house in Rotterdam and arrested me. I was kept in detention for two weeks. Uh, I received a subpoena and in that subpoena they, they said uh, they were charging me for terrorism, which was uh, uh, a laughable, laughable indictment. I became the first person to be charged under that new terrorism act that came into force in 2004 in this country after September 11. I've always told these people that what I do, I do it with passion. I'm not driven by any monetary gain or any physical benefit. If I was doing that, I would have enjoyed my life even better than now. I've suffered, I've been arrested, I've lost loved ones in the process. I have done, I have gone through uh, a torture. You know? But I still stand. If, if I had any criminal tendencies or any criminal past behind me, I would not expose myself the way I'm exposing myself. I am everywhere. My house is open to everybody. The address to where I live currently in the Netherlands is on the internet. My telephone number is on the internet. So right now we're driving to 
the, 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 the office of the Netherland African Business Council. You know, this this is an organization that, that acts as a bridge between Dutch companies that are looking to do business in Africa, link them up with African uh, uh, companies that are also willing to partner with the Dutch companies, and not just African companies, but also African government. I cannot say concrete results, but at least to some extent there is awareness. You know, what people in this country and in Europe and indeed the world now know about the Niger Delta is far much more than they knew of the area as at the time I entered this country newly. I mean, isn't it ironical that even farmers from the remote part of the Niger Delta a sitting court in the Netherlands will agree that they have the jurisdiction to hear a case against their own multinational company for their operations in the Niger Delta. I mean, we saw that there's a current lawsuit in, in the UK. We've seen Shell pay compensation to the families of the Ogoni people out of court settlement. We've seen uh, organizations like Friends of the Earth, Milieu Defense, Amnesty International just came up with a wonderful report on the Niger Delta recently. You talk about financial remuneration. I don't think I, I am in no way compared to the people who actually carry guns and who have made so much money out of the process. And when I've, I, like I told you before, I've been arrested, I've lost loved ones. I uh, currently, the state, Nigerian State Security Service of Nigeria has me in their database. You know, I cannot travel to Nigeria freely, uh, openly, in a country that I call my own. And in this country, that is supposed to be my adopted country, I am facing, uh, I, I, I was charged for terrorism. So you call that uh, uh, enjoyment in the struggle? You know, there is so much for them to see. So if they think it's enjoyment, then they should come and tow my part and, and try to feel what I've been feeling over the years. I want to also uh, believe that five years from now, you know, I mean, in terms of me and my action and my uh, uh, activities, uh, it, it will not remain on this level. It will go higher and it will go higher. So five years from now, I am very positive. It is when I can look back to the Niger Delta and see uh, 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 a, a cleaner way of extracting the natural resources that is in a place. And I can still see young children who are running around, playing, going back to the swamps, you know, doing what our parents did when they were young, I mean, get a better environment for themselves, get infrastructural uh, uh, means for them to have a better social life, and, and also get schools for them to, you know, embrace their education. And when, when, I, when we begin to see that in the Niger Delta, then I think I can sit back and say, well, uh, this is a job well done. Um, this is uh, one of my new projects. Yeah. Uh, Inside Niger Delta magazine, it's a magazine that uh, that has been uh, that has been uh, my dream right from time, and I've always uh, wanted to be a publisher. And the reason being that uh, I feel that uh, uh, information on a print media goes further than you know uh, oral campaigns, and also I want to use it to create a platform for everyone to have a voice so that we can together use this as a medium with which we can send our message to all the stakeholders and for those who want to join hands in working for the betterment of the Niger Delta region. Because there is a saying that if you don't stand up to something, you will fall for anything. So whatever thing you choose to do will challenge you. So in my case, I've chosen this line. But the unfortunate thing I've had to really endure that has even galvanized me more never to give up is the killing of my mother. She would have been alive today if I was not doing what I'm, what I'm doing. So for me, giving up is not an option.